it's very clear to me that if anyone has territorial aspirations what stands for india today which is our army our military etc they will not allow any portion of this country to break away they destroy all indigenous communities which is what they've done in america which is what they've done in australia so it's happening all over the world it's only in india where a defeated army was given a separate caste and a separate occupation so the basis of the caste categorization was neither economic nor social and that period was i think very transformational for me because the mandal commission case happened and the whole issue of caste started coming up then they'll talk about the battle of saragari based on which the kesari film was made now we in indian history have never heard about these things So you you did your masters like what at what uh, juncture in your career did you decide that you wanted to do a master? So uh, so I uh, my father was in civil services. Okay. And so I spent my life in government colonies growing up with a very socialist bent of mind, and uh, then I decided I joined wanted to do law because I had some notion I wanted to help people. um and uh, then uh, i worked for 3 years in law while i was studying law i was working part time with khetan and company okay. which was a big law firm in those days and the moment i graduated i joined kk venugopal who was then a senior counsel and it was recently till recently the attorney general so i was with him for a year and that period was I think very transformational for me because the Mandal Commission case happened and the whole issue of caste started coming up. And I remember my cousin brothers were in university then and they came running home and said what caste are we in because there's groups being formed between upper caste and you know other and it was a fairly uh, scary time because caste was not something we had ever talked about yeah. in our homes. So um to suddenly see the boys we have three I have three cousin brothers being mobilized in this fashion was something quite amazing and in their point look they were all studying in Delhi university and they were expecting skirmishes were breaking out between groups of students now so i studied the mandal commission in great depth oh. yeah so mandal commission is based on a british report which uh, casts all the indian people castes and tribes against the anglo-saxon standard and based on the height of the bridge of the nose the width of the eyes the cheekbone position uh, the jaws they made a grading of what is higher caste and what is lower caste okay, based on facial features based on facial features so it was facial recognition where say they did uh, the say you take for any community and you group it against the anglo-saxon norm of the the, the roman nose and etc and those who were not as per that norm were categorized as lower caste okay so the basis of the caste categorization was neither economic nor social okay it was simply the facial features based on that report mandal went ahead and wrote a report which said that so much of reservation needs to be given for the backward classes so there are there are so called upper castes so the upper castes are the brahmins the uh, why the brahmins because the brahmins collect the chadhava from the mandir that's the privilege they get and in the process they had accumulated lot of land and all that most of which went away in the land sealing but the notions of privilege remain then there are the kings the rajputs who were much more flexible uh in their caste affiliation and uh uh then you had a mixture of various castes so, you know you had the banyas who were so each caste broadly says they are the best they all have their own notions of entitlement and they all have some kingdom they hark back to um about 1000 2000 years ago so it's a very complex scenario where everybody's history is different everybody's personal history and history of their family is different this is not like america where you have broadly 
uh, two groups. You have the indigenous natives who were displaced and then you had the white invaders who displaced them. So there were only two groups who, and they did not come with the um, hierarchy of entitlement that was there in Europe. Okay, so uh, there was no system that this person is a baron, that person is a duke. Everybody was just either white or non-white. So they for, they formulated some notions of, uh, you know, equality and nationhood and all that after they had killed all the indigenous people. Now, the existence of the caste system is, in my view, a example of the tolerant nature of this country. Because in other countries, what they simply do is they destroy all indigenous communities, which is what they've done in America, which is what they've done in Australia. So it's happening all over the world. It's only in India where a defeated army was given a separate caste and a separate occupation. So in a way, in a sense, you can say you can say that was not exactly egalitarian, but definitely it allowed people to live versus the option of executing uh, I'll give you a simple example from history. There was a country called Wal Wallachia, okay, which had uh, Vlad, uh, Count Dracula. You have heard of yeah. Count Dracula? So Count Dracula character was based on uh, King Vlad, who was the main opponent to um, uh, the Ottoman Empire. And through a series of very bloody wars between the Crusaders and the and the Ottomans, you finally reached a stalemate position where Vlad was deposed because he opposed the Ottomans and his own uh, brother, who was kept as a hostage by the Ottomans, was put on the throne. The reason for this was because uh, Mehmed, the uh, the Ottoman emperor, recognized that he could not fight much further. So he needed to broker peace by putting a proxy king on the throne who would, because um, uh, Vlad was very clear that the entire land territory needed to be with the Christians. Uh, even though he had grown up in the Ottoman Empire and Mehmet was very clear that the entire, um, whatever they had taken from the Eastern Roman Empire in Constantinople needed to be Muslim. Uh, so in between, the brother of Count Dracula became the king because he had a more ambivalent attitude and he was not going around trying to... Uh, so so therefore, in India, growing up in India, you wanted to talk about law. So let me tell you what the issue is with law. Uh, we live in a five to 6,000-year-old culture, maybe even older, where, as I said, every single group has their own notions of entitlement and supremacy. And every single group has their own history. So, for example, if you talk to a Sikh from Punjab, they will talk about, uh, Na, what was his name, Nalwa, the general who conquered Afghanistan. Then they'll talk about the Battle of Saragari, based on which the Kesari film was made. Now, we in Indian history have never heard about these things. We have never heard about these versions, these uh, aspects of Sikh history, for example. So similarly, different groups have different histories and the rest all live in within the norms of their community and the truth that has been told to them by their elders. So they believe whatever their elders have told them. The challenge that's happening now for the legal system and for the whole concept of India, you told me we were discussing the concept of India, is with the advent of mass media, many truths which have been held dear in families are getting broadcast to the world, challenged and trolled. So uh, it is, uh, it's leading to this sort of conflict. I've been asked by many people, is India becoming more intolerant? It's not that India is becoming more intolerant. It is very simply that the personal histories of different people are out there in the open. Uh, I'll give you an example. I'm a Bengali and I grew up knowing from hearing from my father about how uh, the last independent Nawab of Bengal, Siraj Dola, was executed by the British. And after which Bengal notions of independence uh, became uh, infructuous and we became a vassal of the British Empire. And my father would say, you don't know you've been born in independent India, how humiliating it was for us to have to uh, sing the British 
an uh, national anthem on the birthday of the Queen. Okay, so that is not something I've experienced, so I would not know about it. Um, but um, th so this was the personal history of my family, which came from Dhaka, 40% of which was then Hindu. Post-1971, all notions of unity vanished. And uh, the people who came here, like me and so many Bengalis uh, all over. So the Bengalis and the Punjabis are basically uh, displaced people who are very familiar with uh, the concept of territorial and ethnic cleansing. Other communities in India are not. So I talked to friends of mine in Jaipur and they said, you know, you don't understand. We were under our Maharaja and we were still under our Maharaja. Nothing has changed. So we were never under the British in that sense. Our Maharaja may have done whatever treaties he wanted, but we do not share the suffering of the rest of India of being persecuted by the British because we were never persecuted. Our kings never let it happen. Yeah. So, you know, this is a different thing. There were no freedom fighters in Rajasthan. Why? Because they were supporting their king. And um, so like this, the personal history of each territory is different. Um, I'll give you one more little example. Uh, the area we're in just now, this is now a Bengali colony, which was given to refugees from partition. And uh, next to us is Kalka Mandir. The Mughal Empire stretched all the way from the Red Fort up to Kalka Mandir. But the Jats never allowed them to transcend beyond this point. So on one side there was Paridabad, on the other side there's Sultanpur. But this thing, this the history of this area, there are no... So when we dug the foundations of this house, there were no... Uh, I remember my mother saying this is very lucky because there are no bones. I said, what do you mean bones? So when typically when you dig a foundation, you find bones because it's been a burial ground or there's been a war or something. But in this plot, there was no such thing. So this is what I mean. The personal history between Sultanpur and Greater Kailash is different. We have different versions of history. So when two areas within a five, eight kilometer radius can have two completely different histories, which is evidenced by the earth, then in a country as large as this, with 570 plus kingdoms who merge to form the Union of India, what is holding India together is only the military, the executive and the judiciary. So my father was part of the government. Uh, I decided to join the judiciary. So the concept of what is India, if you ask an army man, he'll tell you, what is the big deal about Kashmir? He'll tell you it's all about the water. Because once the glaciers go, the whole country will dry up. So we cannot let that happen. So the concepts of uh, some, uh, you know, great reward in the next life or in the next world or whatever is something different. I mean, that no doubt people for their personal peace believe in these things. And, you know, rightly so, because faith is a very important part of life. And everybody should have a faith they believe in. But the concept of a nation is basically a landmass that's held together for the benefit of the people on that landmass. Yeah. And this is something the army understands. In civilian world, nobody really understands. And then there's always, but why is this and why is that? And, uh, you know, people will have so many questions. Also, uh, I think having studied some of the issues in India, it's very clear to me that if anyone has territorial aspirations, what stands for India today, which is our army, our military, etc., they will not allow any portion of this country to break away. Yeah. And there are many portions of this country that want to break away. They are anticipating a future where this country may divide back into the 500 kingdoms it started with. So, balkanization of India. Balkanization of India was a possibility in 1947. And um, if you talk to the people from Bangladesh, which is my ancestral land, they say something very simple. They say, look, uh, in India we go and they say that we are Muslim. But we fought for the independence of India. We did not fight for Pakistan. Instead, we were separated from India and given to Pakistan. 
So then they wanted to impose Urdu on us. Bengal has a very ancient culture, which is basically based on the Pali language. So there was a kingdom called Ganga Hridai, I think it is. You know, I'm I'm just quoting things as I know them from media and my personal research, but I'm no historian. But the, the culture of Ganga Hridai was roughly uh, the same language, same concepts. And then when Buddhism came, the same culture went all the way to Japan and Bali. So when, as a Bengali speaking person, when I listen to Japanese language, I can understand 20% of the words because they're the same as Bengali. So while Bengali now has got more Sanskritized, it has not got Sanskritized enough for us to completely eliminate traces of the ancient languages. I'll give you another example, Urdu. Urdu is based on Khari Boli, which is the language of the people of UP, roughly that you know, Central India region. Um, it is not, so why is it the national language of Pakistan? Pakistan national language should be Punjabi because it's mostly Punjab, but it's not, it's Urdu. So it's very complex. I'm not making any aspersions, but what I'm saying is if you speak to somebody from UP, they say that for the last thousand years, our ancestors have only been speaking Khari Boli. So where, what is the issue here? And then you'll have uh, other people. So it's it's a complex nationhood, identity, are highly nuanced concepts, which are constantly being put to test in the courts of law. So there is no right or wrong. Everything has to be tested against the touchstone of the Constitution of India, which has defined certain rights. So if we as a nation can move ahead beyond uh, 19... Pre-1955 positions to post-1955 Indianhood, then this country will do wonderfully great. It's a great country. We have wonderful people. We have a strong judiciary. We have a good executive. We have an excellent military. But people have to get beyond the struggles of their great, great, great grandfathers, hundred times removed. Because if you don't do that, then you know, you're always going back to the same issues. And um, uh, I mean, the, historically, there was a uh, there was a date, which was uh, 15th August 1947. And uh, from that point on, we need to just focus on being Indian. Focus on being Indian. And I don't believe in the last 70 years, enough stress has been paid on the concept of nationhood and citizenship. It's no one community. It is all communities. Okay, when uh, they make the dietary habits of half of the population is different from dietary habits of the other half. Um, I had, a, there was a map which showed non-vegetarian areas of India. And I remember a very dear friend of mine being absolutely shocked seeing it because he said that, but everyone in India is vegetarian. Because we are Hindus and we are vegetarian. And that's not true. That is not true. That's never been true. So there are other, you know, controversial aspects, so we won't get into that. But we are not one people. Everybody thinks that they represent the only version of Hinduism. But there are many other versions. There were basically four religions that were merged to form the Hindu identity. And uh, even now, though, there have been no changes because um, people are still practicing whatever they learned from their grandparents and ancestors. But we need a citizenship charter. We need uh, some elementary education, a simple thing like pick up a piece of paper and throw it in the garbage can. That training has not been given to almost anyone. And I'm not talking about the poor. I'm talking about wealthy people. They will throw packets out of their Mercedes-Benz cars. They will never stoop down to pick up something they've thrown on the ground. But overall, I'm hopeful for India. I'm hopeful for the concept of India. I'm proud to be a part of the judiciary. I hope that we can resolve all these problems, which situation is without problems. It's a question of identifying it, pinning it down, and finding a resolution. And the resolution is there in our youth. I mean... Uh, it's not that everybody wants to be separate and everybody wants to, but nor do they want to be hunted hunted down and persecuted. I mean, what happened in India in uh, 1984 
what happened in uh, Gujarat. These are all shocking aberrations. It shouldn't have happened. But I'll tell you before that, in Agra, I remember a time when uh, POCL, People's Union for Civil Liberties and PUDR, went to investigate the massacre of Jatav community in Agra. And that was by Hindus. It was not by any other community. So it's not so simple as to say one community is against another community. When they're competing for some common thing, then they will, uh, you know, go for each other. Uh, the only difficult part of this country, what I would consider as the most dangerous part, is through sex selection. We have today many more men than we have women. And women are a moderating factor because women really don't want to get into battle. Uh, with so many men roaming around on any typical day, you know, like uh, you read about uh, the Battle of Haldi Ghati where there were 50,000 men in Haldi Ghati. And today you walk out on the streets, you'll see 50,000 men right there. It's really not a big number today. You know, so uh, so this is the challenge, it's the number of people. And simple, finite rules, a citizenship charter, and some commonality is the only thing that will take this country forward. Uh, as long as people stick to delusions of grandeur and belief in their own superiority, we'll continue to have problems. I read a very interesting article by, a, uh, I saw an interesting article on YouTube by a seer who said that uh, the British have left India, they should have taken Christianity with them. So why do we celebrate Christmas? Now, Christianity in India is as old as uh, St. Thomas. I mean, it is from just after the uh, crucifixion of Christ. It has nothing to do with the British. The British did not bring Christianity to India. So, uh, you know, people also don't know. I mean, I won't give the names, but they should inform themselves before they go on public forums saying things like this, which is very hurtful to many Christians who are uh, who have been Christian for centuries, so uh, mostly in Kerala, but whatever it is. So I'm not on the issue of what religion anyone follows. Everybody should do whatever they want. They should follow whatever gives them comfort and peace in this life. It's a very short life. And uh, within that, if you get comfort from a particular form of prayer, or you get comfort from a particular belief in resurrection or uh, rebirth or new life, whatever it is, that is uh, your, you know, your right and your prerogative. So it's, it's, a, it's a very good thing to follow ceremonies which give you comfort. Uh, but it's not such a good thing to cast shade on other people's beliefs. They should uh, be free to do their thing and you should be free to do your thing. As long as everybody respects each other's life, liberty and personal uh, space. So uh, so that's roughly what I would say. Are there any questions? Any questions? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, but I thought like, you know, since you were talking about it, I didn't want to be, uh, you know, cutting in between because this is really interesting. And the number of questions that have come to me while I was hearing you. So you mentioned about different histories. Interestingly, I just finished reading this book by Vikram Sampath. Okay. He's a historian and he comes again. He's a uh, uh, Alvinist from Bitspalani. And uh, he's written books on Veer Savarkar, but now at latest, uh, he has released this book called his Brave Hearts of Bharat, where he's talking about various freedom fighters from the Northeast, so Lachat uh, Balfakram, and, uh, you know, from Kerala, from various parts of the country. And in the introduction, it's mentioned very, uh, well, there's a very interesting observation that when it comes to Indian students, the way we are taught history, we were always taught about Battle of Plassey. We lost. We were taught about Battle of Buxar. We lost. We were taught about... Oh, did Battle of Buxar, who lost? The Indian side, the, the Nawab. Yeah, the, 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 the combined forces of Bihar and Bengal. Yes, lost. so they lost. Yeah. Then similarly, you look at the Anglo-Maratha Wars. So yes, in the end, the typical wars that we talked about, we have all lost them. So how could it be? Were there no wars that Indians had won? So which is... Uh, what the book covers. It celebrates these brave hearts of Bharat who are typically not known in the mainstream media. And, uh, you know, it talks about the diversity, the cultural diversity of India. And mm -hmm. you mentioned that, for example, the caste system. 
So I don't know uh, how correct is it, but from what I read, with that caste was not something which was very Indianized. It was a casta was a concept that was brought in from Italy, and you know the surveyors were also not aware about. I told you that yeah. report by the British. It was there in Mr. Venugopal's library, but it was very shocking for me that such a such a blatantly racist document could find its way into the law. Wow. It's, it's like saying what uh, Hitler did, right? Uh, defining Aryan race as yeah. somebody who are transcending from the north and, you know, with certain facial yeah. features. Uh, but really interesting, ma'am. Um, so, uh, you know, I want to first of all also be talking to you about law, particularly since you've been practicing law for more than 35 years now. That's right. And you have your own uh, law firm by the name of TSG... I That's mean, correct. Yes, you partners, yeah. right? Um, you studied in India and then you have also did your master's from Stanford. You've read about, I'm pretty sure that laws all across the world, various constitutions, various maybe even uh, religious laws. So if we see like, you know what, 30% of the world's population lives under some religious law, uh, whether we at Sharia and even if we see that, you know, in Northeast there are places in our scheduled 6th and 7th of our constitution where they have their own judicial system, at least in the very um, first or second tier. So uh, that said, how do you think that, you know, if somebody has to pursue law as a career, it changes with country to country, it changes from regions to regions. What are the basic aspects when it comes to understanding law? As a lawyer and somebody who is a citizen, what principles should we keep in mind when we are considering the study of law and order? So, you know, this whole aspect of personal law being governed by very ancient treatises is uh, also uh, part of the reason why we have so many. Uh, it was such a complex issue that uh, when they did the Hindu court bill, they just said subject to customary law that takes care of everything. So polygamy is taken care of by that. Marrying uh, within the prohibited degrees of marriage is taken care of by that. So um, I met, you know, if any go to South India, they regularly marry within the same family. Uh, but um, that is protected by customary practice. But in the North, if you talk about marriage within the same, uh, uh, you know, close kinship, it's uh, abhorrent. I mean, in Haryana, they don't allow you to marry in the same gotra, forget about cousins and such like. So obviously, so you know, you can't go telling South in the entire South that you're not very Indian because you allow marriages between close relatives. Uh, now can you? Um, so it's it's a complex, it's a slippery slope trying to quantify it into one group, and that has not improved with time. Uh, that has not improved with time. So. Uh, the customs continue and uh, the whole country is continuing as it is. And I'm not saying it's right or wrong. Uh, on the other hand, we now have this very Victorian concept. Uh, one of the cases I came across, uh, this couple didn't get along and they had two children and then they separated and um, they filed for divorce. The divorce was not granted. It was not granted. Uh, eventually, it was granted after 20 years when the sons were grown up and they told their mother that, listen, uh, oh, yes, the father's condition was that the custody has to be given to the to him, custody of the children. And the mother wouldn't give up custody. So they would visit their father, but she did not uh, want to uh, give up custody. So then the older son by that stage was an adult and he told his mother, look, the younger one will follow me wherever I go. So you just give custody and give him what he wants. So she did that. And the next year, the man died. So 20 years, both parties could have had a chance to move on with their lives and move beyond the bitter acrimony of divorce that has happened in India. It's fine if people don't get along and if they separate. But this, um, you know, the courts have a construct that this is a religious thing and therefore... We will not allow people to divorce, forgetting we come from centuries of broken marriages and uh, people get along for a while, they don't get along for a while. Um, it's, uh, 
and historically whether you look at uh, karna or whether you look at uh, uh, jesus christ or whether you look at uh, you know the other prophets of religions uh, there were many men who grew up uh, you know without uh, just raised by a mother or just raised by somebody else without this whole issue of custody they still grew up and into great men who may have shaped the world or may not have so it's not necessary as a state it's necessary to make sure all children are safe all children are fed and looked after and allowed to achieve their potential to the degree possible it is not necessary to define which child belongs in which line because hopefully those days when say for instance um haryana went to war with punjab over i mean i've just said as a illustrative thing you know we are now one nation we have one army everybody fights under the same flag now if you look at history look at the ashoka's empire look at the map look at the flag something that's called a flag map uh, the flag map will show you the territory under the control of a particular flag and uh, you'll see the areas that uh, the uh, the 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 deltic area of both the indus and the uh, ganga are both no longer part of india we have no deltas left they both belong to pakistan and bangladesh respectively so um so it's uh, so it's it it's so countries change kingdoms change people don't change and their version of history gets perpetuated from generation to generation and everybody knows the winner writes history but today we have um, i went recently in my search of uh, the truth about uh, you know my own ancestry and my father's whole quest for identity i went to murshidabad and i noticed something very interesting in murshidabad first it was a lovely trip and i strongly recommend for people to visit there who are from the east and uh, secondly is uh, there are, there are a whole lot of these little uh, books little books which are in bengali which are distributed which have a very different version of history from uh, any of the history that is written in uh, uh, mainstream literature so the history in the regional languages the regional vernacular the regional press carries a different version of the truth from the english speaking press and the english speaking uh literature so this is a reality and uh, there's not much you can do about it it's uh, it's it's how it is so i'm within that context uh what do you think about the article 44 of the indian constitution then because you know that's uniform civil court for those who don't know um what what is your opinion upon that so uh yeah so this is a very contentious issue um i mean as a legal professional like yeah as a legal professional i'll tell you what my views are on the subject number one is we have this very uh, uh we have this uh, india the majority in india who are largely hindu have the attitude that monogamy is the only form of marriage allowed in hindus now this is not true because i remember even ram jethmalani had two wives both married before 1955 and he said he said both my wives are very dignified ladies and you know we my first wife and i we fell apart but we didn't uh, divorce or anything and i married a second time and uh, there's so his concept is what was wrong with that so let's not get into personal uh, details but gandhi ji the father of the nation the father of our nation his first civil disobedience movement in south africa started when he started crusading for the rights of the second and third wives and children of indians who were who had moved to south africa so so he said that the british made it illegal for anybody everybody had to have one wife so only the first wife was recognized and only those children were given legitimacy so uh, so gandhi ji's whole point is that this is uh, denigrating to the identity and the rights of the you know second wives and their and their children who would in one stroke become illegal 
the children would become illegitimate and the wives would become mistresses instead of wives so uh, it's a, it's 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 a complicated area because uh, you can't really say that this was if gandhi if if you research into it you'll find that this is this was the real position so we live in a slightly different reality today where people want to feel more superior or more holy or more closer to god and therefore they have to follow a certain code but uh, in doing so they ignore the reality of history they ignore the reality of history and they ignore the reality what is the reality of other societies today so in today's society we have some communities who allow polygamy and they have children and they have uh, uh, wives and uh, they may marry someone at 16 or 17 and then after a couple of years so i've heard a variety of stories i had a driver who would say that he had a twin brother who died and therefore there were two families who were dependent on him um so we didn't exactly believe that but he would go one day to agra and another weekend somewhere else so uh, the so this is the way it is and i'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing i'm not getting into preaching morality to anyone but it's a complex area if we go for a the own the main thing that's standing in the way of a common civil code is the poly, is polygamy equally i've heard hindu men saying our proportion is going down because they took away the right to polygamy so we can't have more children so it's it's a complex area i don't know what the solutions are maybe the solutions are there in the youth but equally we have to have a more realistic attitude to marriage we can't have divorce petitions languishing in the courts for like 20 30 40 years you know it's absolutely unbelievable that a couple can go to their death before they can get divorced in india this should not happen number 1 number 2 is that i am a i consider myself a feminist and part of feminism is women need to earn they need to train themselves and they need to work the the concept that you will get married and then all your life your husband will work and work and work to provide for you and your children is possibly it's it's a great concept and uh, i've had debates with people on this subject because they say that is the most feminist point of view because it's the most pro women because they don't actually have to work uh the men go to work and you relax and have your children and look after your home and the men bring home the money so uh it's 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 difficult to know who is a feminist today is a feminist one who gains the most is a feminist one who earns her own earns her own upkeep is a feminist one who can earn so it's in these are very nuanced complex areas and um i don't want to get into what is i i'm not getting i'm not being prescriptive in any way because i have no interest in influencing anybody else but um but yeah these would have to be debated as to what do people want ideally uh women want some things men want other things uh everybody wants different things now how do where do you draw the line and say this is legitimate and that is not you can't really but yeah all able bodied people should be able to work and earn and they should train themselves exactly when you have an opportunity to train if train yourself why should you not why the sense of uh universal inclusion where we are looking at there is no uh segregation between gender and you know when you're looking at sensitivity of issues such as let's say marriage polygamy so equal rights should apply to everyone but again it's a very contentious concept like you said yeah but you do a poll and find out how many of the women you studied with are still working oh no, i can i can tell you like yeah. i think less than 30% and this i'm and telling you these are the engineers from yes. istilani these are engineers or maybe not not uh, particularly engineers but the typical urban elite background yeah who have graduated from the best of the university the indian universities and colleges that's right so i'm also one more thing with respect to the indian uh, legal system there is right now this debate between judicial activism and review there's a fine line uh-huh. you feel that at times the indian judiciary crosses a certain line which they shouldn't or 
uh, what is the scenario like when it comes to the Indian context of the judiciary playing that role of activist? Uh, obviously, there is PIL, where is this public interest? And uh, that sort of uh, application typically comes from an NGO or let's say somebody mm -hmm. who is aggrieved or is representing an aggrieved. But when judiciary uh, recommends certain things um, that be carried out in a society, in an economy, there goes that uh, very sensitive concept of separation of powers. Right. So what is your view on that? So uh, uh, the thing is, again, this is a very politically controversial area. Uh, the judiciary is there to keep the executive in check. That's the purpose of judicial review. The reason why everything is tested against the Constitution is for judicial review of executive action so that you don't have, you know, a very partisan kind of approach. So it comes back to you have to define citizenship first. Have a sit Before you have a common civil code, have a citizenship charter. Nice. Yes. Interesting, ma'am. Um, so I'm now moving uh, ahead with respect to your career as a lawyer. Hmm. Right? We see all sorts of series. For example, there's Boston Legal, there are Suits, and, uh, you know, being a lawyer is that sort of a career which is sort of glamorized in the mainstream media today. But it is also one of the most important because I feel that when it comes to striking deals, mergers, acquisitions, right? When it comes to political contentious issues, a lawyer has to be present at almost every important meeting. That's correct. So it's a very diverse field. Mm -hmm. So why? what do you think that, why should one become a lawyer, first of all? Because since you're already a lawyer, it's best it comes from your mouth and you know from the horse's mouth that why is this the profession why it, uh, which the young people should consider and what can they do to ensure that they become the best version of the lawyer that they aspire to so uh, law is essentially an entrepreneurial profession so you have to have a, a certain amount of backup if you want to be an entrepreneur it's a very difficult profession for a first generation person to break into just on their own. Law firms give you that option because if you get a job with a law firm, you will get a salary and you will learn some law. But uh, litigation, you need a place to stay, you need to run an office, you have other expenses, uh, clients often don't pay. So you have to be able to bear all of that. Uh, so. You could assume till you're about 30 something, say 34, 35, you will not be earning enough to, um, uh, you know, really sustain yourself meaningfully uh, in for some people. For others, they pick up very quickly. And so there are no certainties. There are no certainties in the field of litigation. There is some certainty and stability in the field of um, corporate law. But it's a function of how many clients you get. So, you know, your big, two big uh, marquee clients go and the firm is over. So it's there is really no, the way a lot of kids from national law school who I've interviewed, they'll come and say, so what is your leave travel policy? What is, uh, what about Provident Fund? And where do you see me five years from now? I don't know where anyone will be five years from now. I don't know where I'll be. So I cannot give those assurances to anyone. So uh, I think the, the, the new law programs are bringing out extremely good lawyers. They're very thorough. They are very good at uh, their work. And um, they, not all of them have a clear idea about what the profession entails. You know, that is essentially entrepreneur. You know, they hear about a few top lawyers and how well they are doing, and then they think that everybody is going to be in that path. But that's not necessarily true. I mean, even if you look at, you know, the, the Indian Administrative Service was the gold standard for, uh, you know, for many years in India, and uh, there are people who don't uh, get promoted. There are people who get... Uh, um, you know, shunted out early in their career. So there are no certainties. Just because you've joined the IS does not mean you will end up as a secretary to the government. 
you may and you may not so um like that in law there are no certainties but yes they get their salaries in law there's no salary during covid it's been so difficult for young lawyers people's practices have wrapped up people have i was talking to a lawyer the other day who has two children and his wife died in covid and now he just does not know what to do do i focus on my career do i focus like what do i do so you know it's it's not easy so it seems glamorous on it screen seems but it's glamorous but there's no health insurance it's it's difficult when you're in litigation because the rights part is about litigation corporate law is about protecting business conglomerates in their deals but the whole aspect of uh, balancing the rights of the of my protecting the rights of minorities balancing inequalities comes up in court litigation and that is where people don't have any certainty so ma'am i'm sure that you know being a lawyer you have to constantly stay updated with the developments that are happening across the world across sectors and maybe specifically to the ones that you're dealing with what sources you know do you recommend to young people who are embracing lifelong learning um that they should consider reading on a very regular basis how do you keep yourself updated see if you want the concept of law i would strongly uh, recommend mc chagla's roses in december it's his autobiography and it was written around the time of partition so he gives uh, his views on many things and it's a very beautifully written simple book but the concept of you know the questions of the concept of what is india who is indian uh, concepts of law some of those are addressed so i would suggest you read uh, of you know books in that genre to understand where and and you know remember that many of the leading uh, freedom fighters were all were all lawyers so the concept of what a nation is comes from law the concept of who an indian is comes from law so you need to understand the laws before you can uh, really proceed with much else in fact uh, you know the 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 version of history we are taught is so completely um different from what actually people remember as per their verbal memory it's uh, you know as as you said you know battle of plassey and battle of buxar and that's it but they don't talk about the anglo maratha wars uh, they don't talk about the maratha incursions into bengal which was another very major you know that is history that is preserved in bangladesh because they don't necessarily see the marathas as freedom fighters they see them as invaders so um it's um, so it's 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 complicated today to understand uh, you know exactly uh we had uh, there was a famous freedom fighter in bengal called shurjo sen okay he did the chittagong armory raid i believe there was a film made about him which abhishek bachchan acted in nobody knows about him anymore because he lived and died in uh, bengal and uh, he fought for india's freedom they will talk about the chittagong armory raid in passing but neither chittagong nor dhaka are now in india so the freedom fighters those freedom fighters are not talked about yeah so the ones these are forgotten in history that brings me to a very interesting point that's been you know going on in my head I typically talk to my students about this bengal is such a rich part of our indian history specifically even with respect to the uh, indian freedom movement for example when we talk about 1905 that was a partition of bengal that uh, sparked that entire yeah. a uh, movement right and at the same time when we talk about the freedom fighters at least the ones which are popular among the indian youth and the indian people generation are particularly let's say rabindranath tagore abindranath tagore subhash chandra bose sarojini naidu i believe that you know uh, bengal at at least uh, in those times was that hot pot where uh, all these movements were coming from where the nation building exercise was primarily happening among the urban uh, people among the rural people and that's that that was the epicenter to, yeah uh, say but what's happening right now uh, see bengal was the epicenter because the british rule was in bengal yeah the british did not run india from delhi till 1911 yeah they ran india from calcutta 
So the protest against the British was also in Calcutta. Uh, so whether you talk about all the, so, you know, the, 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 the whole concept, so that is how Bengal, but what was the uh, result of it from Bengal? They lost the land that they fought for. And uh, if you look at Bangladesh today, their history begins from 1971. Not even by mistake do they acknowledge any history before 1947 or from 47 to 71, other than their freedom struggle. The uh, Tivahini and... Yeah, right. So uh, we are from a place called uh, uh, Bikrampur, Dhaka. Uh, my family, not my husband's, my family. And uh, there, it was a very big Buddhist vihara where Atish, the monk who took Buddhism to Tibet, wrote his some 700 books on Buddhism sitting in Bikrampur, Dhaka. Now they're digging up the fields around uh, Bikrampur and they say that uh, they're in shock because they say there, were, there was a university here. There were temples, there are Buddhist Buddha images. How did that happen? Because the people who are living on that soil now have absolutely no connection with, the his, with what has happened in history. You know, and uh, we, so we are, so for me, for instance, this would be a, a lamentation about the Hindu roots of uh, my people who came to India uh, in 47, following the disastrous partition of India. But equally in uh, Haryana, for example, um, Haryana is a very interesting uh, state. Are either of you from Haryana? Uh, I'm staying in Haryana right now. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, Sanjeev Sanyal has, there's an article, there's a video talk he has given, which is on YouTube where he talks about Bharata, the empire of Bharata, from which Bharat comes. And he roughly says that it is around Haryana. And it was the, the river Saraswati. When the river Saraswati went underground, it became an underground river. Then uh, all those areas dried up. And um, uh, in, in Haryana also, there are two major archaeological digs. One is Rakhigari and one is Sinhali. Now, in Sinhali, they have found a, a warrior, a woman who was buried with her chariot and her arms. So she was obviously a princess of some kind. And, you know, they've tried to draw hin correlations with Hinduism with that, but they've not found any. There are no, uh, obviously, uh, you know, Om, Swastik, that sort of thing is not there. So, um, you know, there's a lot about this land also that we don't know. And only when you dig down will you know the reality of who... Uh, I'll give you another example, which will be very fairly interesting. A lot of the tribal folks in India um, do... They worship Ravana. Okay. So, Ravana was the biggest uh, bhakt of Shiva. And uh, when I went to Murshidabad, they have an image of Ram killing Ravan, but it's a different image. Ravan is praying while Ram is beheading him. Okay, and I asked, why is that? They said, because Ravan was so powerful that he could not die in the normal course. So he prayed to the Lord for deliverance. And deliverance came in the form of Lord Ra uh, Ram, who came and killed him. Yeah. So this is a different version of Ramayana from what typically you'll hear in North India. And uh, so, again, uh, you know... The, uh, Diwali is not celebrated in, more, in many large parts of South India. It's not celebrated in Kerala because it's uh, the defeat of Ravana was not seen as a great victory by the Hindus in the South. So the question is, who is a Hindu? So I've written some things about it in LinkedIn, that the soul of Hinduism is up for grabs. Today, a Hindu is a person who chooses to be a Hindu. It's not necessarily Brahminism. Um, I went to Tamil Nadu where earlier this year they said that all castes can apply to be priests. They have to uh, follow a certain 
you know, pattern of... Uh, and their view was very simple. They said these are all Tamil Sangam era temples when there was no Brahminism and there were no Brahmins. So these are not Brahmin temples. So they have to go back to the people whose temples they were. So, um, you know, so, there, so the concept of what is Hindu is what is up for grabs. Uh, there, is the, uh, there was a certain system of uh, uh, followed in the local kingdoms that were Hindu. That has been, and now, you know, if you look at reservation, it has changed everything. Um, we had, a, uh, so there is this uh, woman, uh, I, uh, this woman I know in uh, Himachal, and she belongs to a backward caste, and she was explaining it to me. She said, Madam, aap log ko pata nahi kuch. I said, hame kyo kya nahi pata? She said, Madam, hum wo jati ke hai, jinko sab kuch milta hai. Hame nokri milti hai, humare bachyo ko preference me admission milta hai, aur mujhe widow's pension, she's a widow, so mujhe widow's pension milta hai, to hum wo log hai, jinko sarkar sab kuch deta hai. Or baki log hai jinko sarkar nahi deta. So this is a very simple village approximation of what reservation means at the village level. So as I said, the soul of Hinduism is up for grabs. Uh, the soul of, um, the, for Indian Muslims, it's very confusing because this was the Mughal Empire and now the division was already done. Uh, four states went to Pakistan and uh, the remaining ones that were Hindu majority stayed here. Uh, so it comes down to the different versions of history. And I wish we could make a fresh start and everybody begin with the proper training of children, with proper citizenship charter, equality for everyone, and no embedded entitlement. But um, whose responsibility is it then? It's the, the state's responsibility. Yeah. The government needed to have taken this up. Why are they allowing uh, uh, children to be brainwashed uh, in uh, different ways by thousands of year old culture of any kind. Now from your conversation, I've been able to figure out that you're sort of disconnected and I think that's one of the prerequisites to be a good lawyer, to be disconnected from the uh, narratives that are being built by every side because you have to be, you know, you have to be a leftist, you have to be a rightist to be representing. I'm completely disconnected from all narrative. Yeah. Because my concept of religion is very simple. I was born, therefore I am. And when I die, I will not be. Yes. Okay, I am not looking forward to entitlement in the next life or any kind of reward. So that's my personal religion. So I do what I think is good in this life. I try not to do things based on personal greed or personal or, you know, like impulsive something. And uh, that's it. So th the rest are all stories. You have a lot of stories. Everybody has stories. Some are called folk tales. Some are called history. Some are called mythology. Um, um, uh, so, you know, they're all stories. You know, the, uh, the Christian church took the icon of uh, the Virgin Mary and her child from a historical queen whose name was Semiramis. So... A lot of the, that whole concept of mother and child um, is far, far more ancient than the birth of Christ. Uh, similarly, if you even look at the Islamic religion, 786 is a very holy number. It's 786, right? Yeah. It's a very holy number, but it's a holy number predating Islam. So no one anymore knows what that number is but it's something that's been found uh, you know in prehistory if you uh, look up Turkey you will find evidence of civilizations which were 10,000, 12,000 years old human history may be as old as like maybe 14,000 years they have this uh, mountain in uh, Malaysia I believe or is it Indonesia I don't recall where um, human beings at some point carved away the top of the mountain, built a series of underground chambers going up to the water, water source, and they built buildings. And they have carbon dated that to 
way before written history. Nobody has any idea who were the people who did this construction. Uh, you know, Stonehenge is another uh, area. In uh, Turkey, they have uh, a place which is like an altar where they have, uh, you know, they have these big stones and they have carved images of of uh, snakes and uh, lizards and different kinds of animals. And that too is some form of religion. Um, Derin Kuyu in Turkey goes down 12 stories. There were people who were just digging underground, building whole cities. Building whole cities. Now, who were these people? What religion did they follow? Uh, if they did not follow any known religion, then um, uh, is it that religion is just a set of armies for world control? Who knows? Okay. Who knows what the truth of that is? When you send men to war, they have to believe in something. Yeah. Okay, they have to believe that their death is worthwhile. And therefore, you have the concept of reward in the afterlife. Uh, when, uh, uh, again, you know, I have studied some, you know, as a lawyer, I've studied different laws. And, uh, you know, if you, uh, if you, you must, if you are really interested in these subjects, you must watch two series on Netflix. One is called The Ottoman and the other is called Ertugul. 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 Okay. Ertugul Resurrection. Both these shows show about the politics of Turkey and Europe and the sort of territorial expansion and what were the things in their mind so it's a, it's a very, um, you know, it's one land mass at the end of the day. Uh, because we are Indian, we sit and we think the Himalayas are the end of the world or the beginning of the world. But there is land beyond. It's all one land. It's one land which through centuries people have been going back and forth. And because of the Himalayas, there's been less, there have been less armies coming back and forth as compared with Central Asia which seems to, in history to just be a continuous series of armies moving back and forth and, you know, taking t uh, control of territory. And India was no different. If you see the movie Bahubali, that's all it talks about, raiding different villages and carrying away people as slaves. So we conveniently ignored the history of the Pratiharas and the, all the different warring tribes and uh, think everybody was, you know, being good and vegetarian and praying to the same gods. But that's not necessarily the case. Who knows what the truth is? The question is, how do we move forward from there? And we move forward from there through strong judiciary, strong legal system and a citizenship charter for everyone. Issues like polygamy can be dealt with separately. But equally, this uh, the concept that... Uh, uh, marriage is in the eyes of God and is not a social contract uh, also is something that needs to be, uh, you know, the expectations need to be addressed. Right. Um, so I'm, again, I'm not, you know, formally trained as a lawyer, but I try to, you know, keep my hands on maybe a couple of books and some video lecture series. I was very fortunate to come across this uh, open lecture series by Michael Sandals, mm -hmm. where he's talking about what is justice. And then there's this typical classical example where you have to make that choice between a train, either killing four people or one person. I'd like to you know, hear your thoughts about it. That, you know, when it comes to understanding justice, yeah. what really is, because there are people who write about justice. So, I mean, um, there is this uh, political philosopher also, um, John Rawls, hmm. right? So Rawls talks about that veil of ignorance and so there are various views on it. And again, somebody who's been practicing law for so long, I'd like to, I'd like you to explain it to kids, to young people, to anyone who's not a lawyer as to what it really means to be just in your understanding, in your terms. So just, justice should mean the right to life, liberty, and the right to hold your own property. It should mean that. There are two, there's an interesting book called Lord of the Flies, which is again an old book. It's about a group of children who end up marooned on a desert island. 
and they evolve their own laws. So it's a slightly brutal book, but it's uh, it explains the process of how laws are created. Uh, so laws are created mostly for the greater good. And uh, individuals may suffer in the process. You know, what you were talking about, the train. The way we studied it was, I remember my professor, Tahir Mahmood, who was uh, my professor of personal law, and he's like a nationally renowned expert on personal law of, um, you know, of all religions. So we, I learned from him, so it was a great, uh, it, was, it was a real eye-opener. He used to tell us that if a group of um, uh, trekkers are caught in a landslide in a cave on the border between two countries, the question is um, the laws that evolve over there. So neither the laws of neither country operate. Okay, and it's a matter of survival. So you have to figure that is where the question of what is natural law comes in. So uh, in between all of that, I think protection of minorities is a very big part of law. That uh, minority rights should be, nobody should have to die, nobody should have to lose their property. You know, what is this concept of private property? Like who decided that this land is mine? Because I'm sure that there has to be that one person who made that marking and said that this is my land. And, you know, how how did it go about? For example, I think John Locke mentioned something about property, if I'm not um, wrong, or maybe one of these political philosophers. Yeah. Where they're talking about, you know, private property, the very beginning of it. Yeah. So the thing is that um, uh, uh, um, Lenin... Uh, Lenin, in his writing, says that uh, private property is the source of all uh, corruption. So uh, the moment you have the concept of private property, people start fighting to gain control. So uh, there was this movie called The Gods Must Be Crazy, where there's a tribal community in Africa, and then an uh, empty Coca-Cola can or bottle falls from the sky and they think it's a gift from the heavens. So that starts off their uh, sort of, uh, you know, that starts off the divisions in the group. Um, so yeah, so so an, uh, a land, a territory is a place where you can live peacefully with your family and your children are safe. And you can use that land to grow. Uh, land was the only marker of wealth, land and heads of cattle in the old days. So uh, you can use that to grow your family and provide for your family. Uh, tribal communities don't have that concept, so they have more, it's the forest, it's between them and the forest and the land. So they don't necessarily do agriculture, they, uh, they, uh, they're forest gatherers, forest uh, dwellers. So they have, try and live in harmony with the forest. And they try to live in harmony with the forest, but now... Uh, for instance, in India, the government has given everybody plots of land and said, now sit here, don't go wandering around in the forest. So their their ancestral ways for thousands of years uh, have got disrupted. So now they are trying to adjust to living on a plot of land, which uh, and a lot of the traditional knowledge they had of the plants and will will eventually get lost because of this sort of enforced colonization of tribal people. Um, especially if you think of it another way. They did a DNA analysis once and they found that a lot of tribals in uh, the Jharkhan Chhattisgarh area have almost identical DNA to the people from the Indus Valley civilization. So hypothetically, suppose, this is just a question I'm putting out there, supposing when uh, the famous Mohenjo-Daro Harappa deaths occurred, people moved and landed on this side. We're talking about some of the most ancient people of India, you know, far more ancient than most of the people in North India who have come from various parts of, uh, you know, um, uh, so, uh, various parts of Central Asia and the North. People from Afghanistan. Afghanistan was a part of India. Uh, so people from Afghanistan who came to Delhi are were still within their country and then there were borders drawn so do they are they afghani are they you know i've met uh, baluchi hindus i've met Multani hindus i've met of course punjabi hindus 
and uh, the communities were all intermixed. So the concept of one land for one religion was not there before. But now, so there is, I also hear this sometimes, that see, the Jews have their own state, right? Mm. And I think that was one of these uh, recently made states in recent history, which was also done and gone through a legal manner. And there was this question of, I think, Gertrude Bell, who wrote the first white paper where the entire Iraq and that Levant region was sort of carved out. Right now, we're seeing that there are Kurdish people who are demanding Kurdistan. And again, like you said, that there are different people with different histories and different cultures who are going to demand some sort of, uh, uh, you know, the right monologue. Without being persecuted. Yes. So this is that monoculture that we're talking about. And monocultures may have certain benefits. Monoculture is also a method of mono-elitism. Yeah. So what they're saying is your elite must suffer and our elite must take over. And, uh, um, you know, if you take the example of the, uh, you know, what happened in Syria. So let's talk about Syria for a moment. I met this uh, sadhu who uh, was... He was a, he was wearing you know the saffron robes and all and uh, talking to him I he he was obviously Arab so I mean he had that Middle Eastern accent so I asked him so like where are you from and he said I'm from Syria I said and you are a Hindu monk he said yes uh, I said but how come he said why don't you pick up your phone and Google Sun Nation. So I did, and the first thing that comes up is Syria. So he said Syria was originally Surya. So they used to be sun worshippers. I think uh, Ra was like the Egyptian Ra. Ra was the sun god, and from which they got Ram, they got Ramses, they got Ramoses, all the different variations from Ra. And uh, so the, the culture, the Rig Vedic culture, which includes the term Ra and Ram and uh, Surya uh, were possibly a lot more widespread than we imagined possible and possibly not, ep you know, the epicenter could have been anywhere, but um, we have may have more in common with Middle Eastern people than we imagined possible. So it's a... Uh, uh, According to this gentleman, there are sun temples in Syria. And then I asked about the Yazdis, and he said that, uh, you know, it's their misfortune that oil was found on the lands they have hereditarily occupied. So they needed a reason to evict them from the land so they could exploit the oil. So um, uh, it's uh, if no oil was found, the issue of religious persecution would not have arisen. They would have been left to be pastoral people roaming around, uh, worshipping in whatever manner they worshipped. So it ultimately comes down to economic interests. It comes down to trade. It comes down to, uh, you know, self-interest of a certain group of people. So... So interesting, ma'am. You know what, that... Um... Also brings me to another question. We're talking about different laws, different constitutions, like right? every land, you know, when it's say it's a law of the land. But at the same time, when it comes to globalization, business today, we're talking about trips, we're talking about WTO, there is a demand for uh, universal corporate rate, the acceptable corporate rate, right? It's coming from OECD. We're talking about you know, formalization or... Uh, so-called one law for when it comes to international trade, international businesses, at least in, in, in the broader sense. Do you see human rights going that way? Although there is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but uh, in terms of the progress when it comes, it's still not comparable to the economic side of law. Uh, do you think that there are certain loopholes, certain areas, certain leaders were not willing to do that? If not, why? What could be the way forward? Uh, so, as I said, that, uh, you know, uh, from what I've understood is all the worst case scenarios arise whenever there is a change in governance and or there is a break in the rule of law. 
So rule of law is the only thing which prevents chaos and anarchy. And that has to be enforced. Okay, so rule of law must be in place. You must have protection of minorities. People should not be persecuted for no reason related to them. You cannot stop mob action if some incident happens and people get angry and that leads to some consequences. That may be a spontaneous thing, but from the state, the duty of the state is to enforce rule of law. So for that, you know, they have various tools. They can impose a, impose a curfew, don't allow groups to move around. Uh, but um, it's all based on various uh, misconceptions. There was uh, some misconception. We, different points of time, we've had different, um, you know, um, f uh, rumors floating. For example, uh, men, some years ago, there was a rumor that people were picking up children and putting them in bories and taking them away. Similarly, there were some rumors floated about Northeast, Northeast people, which led to riots in Bangalore. So in this way, irresponsible reporting, irresponsible transmission of information, which has increased so much in the present era, uh, is causing a lot of damage and they need to be even more stringent on cyber, uh, cyber acts that purport to create hatred between communities. All right. So the British had a very good system. They would say one community, there was a riot between two communities and so many people died. They would not ascribe blame. They would not say A did this to B or B did this to A. So, you know, you have to have more responsible reporting. Um, uh, more responsible reporting, less of a feeling of otherness. So an otherness also comes, the vast majority today still doesn't care that much. There is not so much othering. But if people go on about being othering, it, being othered, it may, may actually happen, which will be bad consequences for everyone. So therefore, bring people back, divert their energy to something else, bring them on a citizenship platform. Sure. You so know, think... Those are the only ways forward. And law is an essential part of that. Rule of law is an essential part of that. The courts are an essential part of that. Legal training for all citizens in India is an essential part of that. Everybody needs to know their rights and their duties. You know, rights without responsibilities is meaningless. So they need to know what their responsibilities are too. So if we are to blend this group of some 570 odd kingdoms into one mass of people, it can't be one group persecuting the others. It can't be one set of entitlement replacing another set of entitlement. Everybody has to be given an equal opportunity to run the race. Absolutely. So, um... Ma'am, I think this has been a very insightful conversation. I've gotten to know so much about history, about, you know, how law operates. And specifically, the way you think about and, you know, to be able to disconnect yourselves from the realities uh, that have been framed by somebody else. Because your own reality is going to be dependent upon how and what kind of knowledge and data that you're exposed to. And I think being a lawyer involves a lot more practice and a lot more, um, if I were to say, wisdom uh, than anyone because it's a profession in itself. So uh, before we part, I'd want you to probably give your two cents about aspiring lawyers in India and in general, the young students as to what they can do to ensure that they are active citizens, right? When you talk about citizen uh, charter when you talked about us becoming let's say a global citizen so what advice would you give to aspiring lawyers and to citizens in general to the young citizens of our country so i would encourage young people to uh, build a strong factual mind understand the reality instead of what people tell you don't just follow what the newscasters say at 11 because it's all colored and uh Try to find the truth yourself 
and make yourself physically and mentally strong to be a warrior for the rule of law in this country. Wow. So I think that's some set up as to what an holistic education truly should be aspiring for. Thank you so much for your time, ma'am. It's been a pleasure having you. And I truly hope that the One Young India community learns from your experiences and the things that you shared with us. Thank you so much, Swagat. It's been a delight getting on this chat. And I hope somewhere it makes sense to some people and they are influenced to take up the battle for uh, ensuring rule of law in India.